Hi, I'm Adrian Cockcroft. Over the years, I've given a lot of talks on microservices and cloud architectures, and there are some ideas I always wanted to illustrate with a short animated sequence. So I've worked with a visual design team to come up with a series of animations, each illustrating a specific concept. This month, I'm going to talk about unblocking innovation for digital transformation. In many of the talks I give, um, I'm talking to enterprises about how they're being disrupted and how they're attacking new markets and responding to changes in, uh, around the world. This digital transformation is something that is true across many industries. So I've got a, a fairly generic presentation here. It's something that, um, that I think is particularly interesting for people that are going through this kind of transition. And I'll start by looking at old world IT. In the old world, you were managing employees at work, you were managing factories and supply chain, sales channels, and then your marketing analytics were driven from print and TV media. So that's the old world. In the new world, though, we're connected, and we're using the internet and mobile applications to connect directly to employees all the time, wherever they are. Uh, we have factories and supply chain with continuous tracking and much more fine-grained detail. We have online sales and delivery. And we, instead of putting something in a box and shipping it out and hoping you never see it again, because if you see it again, it means something went wrong with it, the things you're shipping are IoT connected. They are, you, you find out about them every few minutes. They call back to you. And if you stop hearing from them, you, you need to worry about it. And then marketing has moved online. Uh, you need to be watching Twitter and Facebook and um, social media in general. What are customers saying about your products? You need to respond immediately. You can't just you know, figure out what happened to that print ad you put out last week. So what this is driving is new needs. You're now directly connected to customers, so you need to generate personalization that uh, addresses every individual customer differently. In many businesses, your customer used to be the retailer or the intermediary. Now the customer goes all the way to the end user. Uh, a couple of examples here. If you think about uh, TV stations, um, you would make content. You'd put it on at 9 PM. You'd hope customer watched it. You'd go and ask somebody like Nielsen how many people watched it. Then you'd figure out how much you could charge for the advertising. So that's the old world of TV. In the new world, you have companies like Netflix and Amazon Prime Video and Hulu. And they're directly connected to the customer. They know exactly who watched what and can deliver new content directly to the people that they know are going to like it. So that's the personalization piece. Then you need to use customer analytics to figure out exactly how customers are interacting with your product. Um, again, huge amounts more data coming in here. So what you're really doing here is managing new channels directly to your customer. There are many more things to manage, much more scale, and those things are changing much more rapidly. So that's, that's the digital disruption that applies across so many different industries. And here's a quote from Gartner. Through 2021, 75% of digital leaders will dominate a disruptive market segment that did not exist prior to their ascendance. So global online TV channels, that's Netflix. Um, ride sharing, you have companies like Uber and Lyft. Um, these are new markets that uh, didn't really exist before they came along. So what are we doing? AWS has been unblocking innovation for digital transformation with its enterprise customers. And there are lots of examples from this. But they typically go through a few different patterns. So I'm going to talk about four different things that tend to be the blockers you have to work with to get through that innovation, and then three different stages that that goes through. Here's the blockers. Culture, skills, organization, and finance. I'll go through each of these in turn. If we look at the leadership systems and feedback, one of the things that can get in your way is centralized decision making and then lack of trust, inflexible policies and processes. You have to figure out how to go at speed and to make decisions uh, that are local and fast. Because if you take everything to be central, then you can't make enough decisions quickly enough to actually compete in this new world. There's a few interesting new books that you should be looking at as well. Stephen Auburn and Mark Schwartz from uh, AWS have both published uh, books recently, um, A Head in the Cloud and uh, A Seat at the Table. You should go have a look at those. Next, the skills. Training and compensation is a big issue. So what should you do? You really have to train existing staff on cloud technology. People go out and try to hire people, and you maybe can find a few people to hire. But 
I think the key thing is that cloud technology is actually fundamentally easier to deal with than traditional data center technology. Running things as a service, less work than creating them yourselves. The main issue is it's unfamiliar. It's not difficult, it's just unfamiliar. So you may want to go through, and you know, AWS has got lots of experience helping people get up to speed. We have systems integrators and other people in our partner ecosystem who can come and help you get up to speed and get, get everything working yourself. You should also work to fund Pathfinder teams and get people up to speed by having small groups, get them to go try things out and uh, figure out what works for you, and experiment a few times, and then take those teams and scale those out with more teams. Another thing to think about, there is a, there is a market for uh, people that are experienced in cloud. So as you develop uh, your own in-house experience, you'll find that uh, some of your staff are tempted to leave because they're now more valuable and people are trying to, other people are trying to recruit them away. It's, you know, really it's a factor of life. Um, and it's also a, can be an, a, a, an incentive for your staff to actually go and retrain themselves. But what you should think about in advance is how are you going to keep these people, maybe you, there's an incentive program, there's some way that you can get them to think about staying and motivate them to stay after they've been trained. So if you, just let, if you don't get something out there in front, you may find that you lose more people than if you think about this up front and have a plan to figure out how to keep people. There's a particularly good book that just came out by Patty McCord, the Netflix's chief talent officer. Uh, used to work with Patty, she's awesome. And this book is about getting out of the way of innovation. It's called Powerful, and it's got lots of great ideas for how you can build a really a high talent density team that will be very powerful at getting problems solved for your company. So that's skills. Let's now look at organization. We tend to be wanting to move from projects to product teams. This gives you long-term product ownership for the things you're building rather than short-term uh, working just on incremental changes. It really supports continuous delivery. And then DevOps and uh, something that Werner Vogels uh, came up with in 2005 or 2006, he said, run what you wrote. And that's the principle that AWS runs on, it's what Amazon runs on, and uh, it's what Netflix and what we did at Netflix when we were building out our, our processes there. We wanted the team that built the service to be responsible for running, up, for running it, to be on call, and then they built a better service and they were able to iterate much faster. This also, as a side effect, reduces tech debt and lock-in because if you're changing something continuous, you're not getting locked into it. If you, have a long, if you have a project that ends, then at the point where that project ends is where the lock-in starts. There's a couple of good books here as well. The Phoenix Project by Dean Kim and the DevOps Handbook, also by Gene Kim. These give you great ideas for how to organize yourself and the sort of motivation for doing this. The Phoenix Project is actually a novel uh, telling the story of a company that is learning how to do agile software development. So that's organization. Now let's look at finance. Um, when you move to cloud you, and when you move to DevOps, you get changes in the things that you can capitalize versus the things that are financed from an operational perspective. And both of these things drive uh, changes. Uh, eventually, once you get a substantial amount of change, this can go all the way to your bottom line. It can affect the numbers that you report on a quarterly basis. And for public companies, um, you can actually run into the CFO. Sometimes the CFO is controlling your architecture because they're trying to slow down cloud migration because it's moving the the CapEx, OpEx numbers around. That isn't an issue for all companies, but it is for some. And it's something you should try and plan for so that you can signal the market and say, we're expecting because of our great cloud translation that's going really fast, that we're going to be doing less capitalization and more operational expense. So those are the blockers that, that may stop you getting there. But now I'm gonna talk about the pathway for how you get there. The first thing we always optimize for is speed. Then we optimize for scale then eventually we get to the strategic workloads. When we're optimizing for speed, we're trying to get better time to value. So if I do some work, if I write some code, how soon is that code acting on the behalf of the customer or reaching a customer? Uh, hopefully it's tomorrow, not three months from now. Once you've got speed figured out, you're getting some quick wins. Next thing you'll go for is scale. As you roll out larger and larger services, you get horizontally scaled applications and you need to start optimizing capacity and running really high utilization rates. 
Finally, once you've got going at scale for most of your new type of applications, you start looking at data center replacement, some of the critical workloads that are running there that are moving large amounts of money around or supporting uh, safety critical or business critical workloads. This is an interesting area that we're starting to get into with AWS as more and more customers are doing data center replacement. So let's have a look at time to value. What's the difference between fast companies and slow companies? Well, it's 440 times. And how do I know that? There's a very good survey that was done um, by Nicole Forsgren, Jean, uh, Jess Humble, and Jean Kim. Uh, they're written up into a book. It's got lots of interesting information in it. Here's a quote from the book. We found that compared to low performers, high performers have 46 times more frequent code deployments, 440 times faster lead time from commit to deploy, 170 times faster mean time to recover from downtime, and five times lower change failure rate. So a fifth is likely for a change to fail any given point at different given time interval. So that's basically going from months to hours. That's a huge difference, and um, it was, it's hard to believe if you're, if you're taking things to, that take months and turning them into things that take hours, but there's plenty of examples of companies that have been through this transition. So moving on, distributed optimized capacity. What we're talking about here is highly scaled workloads that are distributed to get high availability, they're cost optimized for high utilization, and they follow a cloud native architecture. Here's some principles for cloud native. I'll go into this in more detail in another talk, but I'm just gonna summarize them today. The principles are that you pay as you go, and you pay a month in arrears. It's self-service, everything's API driven, everything's automated, you're not filing tickets and waiting. Everything's globally distributed by default. You've got cross-zone and cross-region availability models available to you. And everything is high utilization. You turn idle resources off very aggressively. And you do immutable code deployments, containerized or using uh, AMIs to, to bake your code, rather than using, um, using tools that update a machine in place. That's because it's so easy to just get a new machine with the new configuration. So this is the pathway speed, scale, and strategic. Now, when we get to strategic workloads, we're looking at availability as a critical aspect of it. And Chris Pinkham, who was one of the engineers, uh, engineering managers when we were originally building EC2 at AWS, he said that you can't legislate against failure. So what you should do is focus on fast detection and response. So let's think about this and, and relate it to something that everybody knows. Everybody, at some point, has had to do a fire drill. If you work in a large building, every now and again you have to go and file out of the building, not use the elevators, and go stand in the parking lot and do a roll call. It's a little bit boring, and uh, people usually groan when the fire alarm goes off because it's interrupting a meeting. But every now and again, the building really is on fire, and in that case, it saves lives because people are trained how to react and get out without panicking, and you don't get a queue of people waiting at the, uh, at the elevator to get out. But here's the real question. Who runs the fire drill for IT? If something goes wrong with your systems, you need to figure out how to work on this. So I arrange the systems into these different layers. You've got the infrastructure at the bottom. There's some switching layer that connects your application to the infrastructure, the application itself, and then the people that are operating it. How do you exercise everything? Well, there's a new team that people have been talking about called the Chaos Engineering Team. And another book you should read, from, from published by O'Reilly, but written by engineers from Netflix. If you get Chaos Engineering right, it ensures you have experienced staff that know how to respond to issues. You have robust applications that won't just fall over if something goes wrong. You've got a dependable switching fabric that can route around problems, and you've got enough redundancy in your service foundation. And what we're finding is that expensive and custom disaster recovery, the typical thing of having data center failover, it's very difficult to get that to work. But it's being replaced now by low cost, portable, and automated chaos engineering principles. That's the pathway. I'll talk a bit more about some of these topics in more detail in future months, but I wanted to give you the overview this time. And that's what I think about unblocking innovation for digital transformation. Thanks very much.